Uh, right then, David. So it's 9.15 a.m. on Monday morning when we're recording this. By the time it dropped, who knows what might have changed. So let's rattle through it, get it out, and hopefully half of it is at least accurate. From my point, all of it's accurate from your point of view, but from my <laughs> point of view and the questions that I'm asking. Uh, let's start with Arsenal's pursuit, and this could really have changed by the time it dropped, <laughs> of Caicedo at Brighton. Where are we at? Yeah, it's clear how much Arsenal want to sign Moises Caicedo because they came with a, in with a £60 million offer, which was a fixed fee, no add-ons, last week, and that was £5 million higher than the story we revealed the week previously on The Athletic that Chelsea had offered £55 million. Um, it was rejected out of hand by Brighton, who value Caicedo far higher than £60 million, even though he's had a relatively small number of Premier League games. He's only 21 years old, but they've got him under contract until 2025. And we also reveal in my Monday column that they have an option to extend that by 12 months to 2026. Um, their stance has been clear throughout. He's not for sale. He's not going anywhere. That did not, however, deter Arsenal, who have come back in in uh, on Sunday night with a proposal worth £65 million plus £5 million in add-ons, taking it to a total of £70 million. That was also very quickly uh, rebuffed by Brighton, who don't really want to keep doing this because they've made clear to Arsenal that their stance is not going to change. But clearly, Arsenal's interest remains because they feel that they have to get a top midfielder in during this transfer window. They're prepared to pay big money to do so. And if it's not going to be Caicedo, the big question is going to become, who do they go for before that deadline? Um, at the start of the window, or let's say in December, was the plan for Arsenal to always get a, a wide player, an attacking player, which they have obviously in Trossard, a defender, and they've brought a defender in as well, and a midfielder. Was that always the plan or have they accelerated things because of where they are? The initial plan was a wide player as a priority, and that's why they went so far on Mikelo Mudrik before getting gazumped by Chelsea. Um, the left-sided centre-back cover for Gabriel has always been on the agenda, whether it was in January or the summer, and it was about the right opportunity arising, and it did with Kivior from Spezia. Now, bringing in a central midfielder has long been on the sort of wider radar because you'll remember that last summer when they didn't manage to get a wide player in the form of Pedro Neto or Rafinha and there was an injury to Mohamed El Nenny heading towards the deadline day, they pivoted and they went for Douglas Luisa at Aston Villa. They didn't manage to get him on that occasion. And then the progress in central midfield of Thomas Partey fitness-wise, Granite Xhaka and El Nenny returning to fitness meant that for January, they returned to the original priority of the wide player. But in training, Mohamed El Nenny suffered uh, an injury. Um, and therefore, the consideration came back to a central midfielder. I think they looked at the boy, for example, at Real Sociedad, who has a release clause that I think Arsenal would have been prepared to pay, but I'm not sure if he wants to move during the January transfer window. So they were initially looking at that bracket. When it seemed clear and has been well documented that El Nenny could be out for quite some time. And then Thomas Partey suffered what they'll hope is a minor rib injury in the FA Cup against Manchester City. I think they were already by then thinking we need to go to this higher tier. And that's when Caicedo comes into the mix. Um, maybe there are some others there too. We know that there's admiration for Declan Rice, but it doesn't look like that's conceivable in this particular transfer window, more one for the summer. And I don't know if there's anybody else in that top bracket either. If not, then they're going to have to look at alternative options within the market. And of course, the time is ticking. Uh, but here's the thing on this then. Is this a... Is this they need a midfielder, so they've just decided to go for Caicedo, and then if he isn't available, they'll look at someone else? Because you mentioned Rice there. Or is this a, we can't get Caicedo, therefore we're going to hold fire and see which of our primary targets is available in the summer, which, as lots of people will point out, is a way that Liverpool used to do things, such as the often talked about eventual Van Dyke deal. 
I think at the time of recording, Arsenal are still focused on trying to get Caicedo or somebody of that calibre. I don't think they have given up at this point in time. Now, Brighton's stance will be that they're wasting their time. And of course, these things change very quickly. So the way that Arsenal have gone about their business in recent times, the surprise signing of Kivior uh, and a few others, uh, to be fair, Fabio Vieira springs to mind, suggests that they could be doing something else behind the scenes, but they have become very fixated on getting that high level player. And to go back to your previous point, bringing forward the plan to sign a high level midfielder in January. I don't think the transfer fee for Declan Rice would be affordable in this month. I don't know if he's minded to move or if West Ham would even consider his departure. And that's why it was always one for the summer agenda. Um, and so whether if they don't get Caicedo, they have somebody else lined up or they park it to the summer, I'm not certain because you can never guarantee anything in this market and they won't want to bring somebody in that doesn't improve them or fit in well with their squad chemistry and the trajectory and the um, path they're on at the moment. But from every conversation I've had around the situation, it's inconceivable for Arsenal to not strengthen with a high quality addition in this market. Let's get the Brighton perspective on this with the Athletics. Andy Naylor, have Arsenal underestimated Brighton? They certainly have, I think, Mark. Um, trying to play poker with Tony Bloom in the January transfer. <laughs> um, I think there's only going to be one winner in that scenario. Look, the situation at Brighton is quite clear, and this is the way they do things, both buying and selling. They've got their own valuations on players, which they never divulge. And two things have to happen. The price has to be right, and the circumstances have to be right. They don't, as a rule, like January uh, because it's a condensed period. If you look at the main sales they've made, they've been in the summer. Ben White started, Eve Basuma and Mark Cucurella. So I think I think there's a recognition and an appreciation that there's every chance that uh, Cachega will go in the summer. And what's happened here, I think there's been a tipping point, and that tipping point came on Friday night when... Uh, uh, Moises released this uh, statement on social media saying he wanted to leave. Brighton had already been agitated about the way uh, the news was leaking, if you like, of, of, of interest through, um, let's call them agents of agents. And um, they've just decided, right, we're going to shut this down. So they say to the player, look, go away. Don't come to training, leave you out the Liverpool game, get your head around the fact that you're focused on Brighton for the rest of the season. Because let's bear in mind, this is a club trying to qualify for Europe for the first time in their history. On well, that, 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 was go, that was going to be my point, Andy. It's not like they're in 12th and are just going to sort of sleepwalk the way to the end of the season with Premier League safety assured I mean they've got they've got real chances of doing something here exactly on two fronts Roberto De Zerbi made that point in his press conference on Friday when I asked him about it they can't they're looking at league position qualification and the FA Cup uh, mm. as, as routes for Europe um, will they achieve that it's still going to be difficult but they're certainly fighting for it they're certainly pitching for it and the last thing they want to do, from Tony Bloom's point of view, is lose one of their key players in that pursuit this late in the January window. They are, obviously, as we've discussed many times on this podcast, known for their forward planning. And in fact, one of the reasons Basuma was allowed to go to Tottenham was because Caicedo was then ready to step up in into that role. I mean... <laughs> There comes a limit to how much forward planning you could do in one season. Uh, bearing in mind, in the last 18 months, their director of football has gone to Newcastle. The majority of their backroom staff and recruitment staff seem to have gone to Chelsea. Their manager's gone to Chelsea. One of, one of their players has gone to Chelsea. Another one went to... I mean, th there comes a point where you go, crikey, you know, our forward planning can't cope with all of this. Yeah. Are they at that stage? 
or do, do they do they have a replacement ready to go for Kai <laughs> I, I don't think they are at that stage because because as as you indicated, Martin, you said before, Brighton work. It's this long term vision and this long term planning all the time, which means they're not only looking at this window; they're, they're looking at the win, next window, the one after that. Yasin Oyari, who's a 19 year old prospect at AIK in Sweden, uh, a trademark, if you like, Brighton signing, a young player relatively low cost who they can develop he's he's not an immediate replacement for Pachego but he could become a first team player further down the line they were also interested in a midfielder at uh, Red Bull Leipzig um, Hadara Hadara that's right yeah they, there was interest there but my understanding is that 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 is not going to happen certainly not in this window but often with Brighton, these these deals they're revisited in in the next window. Um, they did that with this young Argentinian prospect who they signed, Facundo Buonanotti. They were looking at him in August, couldn't get it over the line. Then have got it over the line in in January. So it, at all levels, it's not just on the player front in terms of the staff they've lost. They're always looking ahead. Tony Bloom, as we speak, will have. Three probably at least a short list of potential head coaches to replace Roberto De Zerbi. because you can guarantee that it come the summer if things continue the way they are and big club big job vacancies come up whose name is going to be linked? Yeah, I just want to make a quick point on that. Brighton were, as I understand it, looking at potential replacements. But I don't want that to turn into a, a big story because they are looking at potential replacements all the time. As Andy says, this is part of their normal recruitment process. So if something outrageous happened and Caicedo did end up leaving, then they do have their irons in fires. And I can see us being in this position at some point on Mitoma, who looks like yeah. the next cab off the rank and Brighton will hope he'll be with them for a long time to come but speaking to people around the industry and the market they're all thinking goodness me when are we going to be in this saga all over again with Mitoma well as Jerry Durso uh, of the Athletic recently pointed out on social media they're just like the sugar babes at, at Brighton one one leaves another one comes in and they still keep getting number ones uh, <laughs> which is which is a very good, which is a very very good uh, comparison. Um, do, do you just uh, just a final one on uh, on Brighton? Eventually, there will be a number that they will do business on, Andy, on any player. Yes, yes, but as I said, Mark, there will be a number, but also within that, the circumstances have to be right as well. So what we've got here is Arsenal are nowhere near the number, and the circumstances are not right. Just one extra tiny point on that. A lot of surprise that Arsenal are going so far, so high, uncharacteristically so, on this sort of player. But you need to understand that he is among a small number of central midfielders who are extremely hot property at the moment. It includes Enzo Fernandez, Jude Bellingham, um, and a couple more. Um Chelsea are in that market as well, which I'm sure we're going to come on to speak about. Chelsea are in Chelsea are in every market. To every be honest market, with you, of course. if they're listening to this, they're probably going to sign the four players that Andy mentioned before as well. And, but anyhow, go on. And us three as well. But the <laughs> uh, but the the value in an Arsenal pushing so high for an ex Premier League experienced 21 year old who. Um, is regarded as having the capacity to be among the very best central midfielders in the game, given current valuations and what others are going to be putting bids in more likely in the summer for this player and others means that they're trying to get ahead of that battle. It's what Chelsea are trying to do as we speak on Enzo Fernandez, because, and Brighton know this acutely, when you get into that summer market, there will be more options. They'll get at least the same numbers again and barring an injury or a downturn in form it will work out better possibly for Caicedo and for Brighton in the next market than it will now and that's why an Arsenal is trying to pounce now <laughs> 